Welcome to the Watchman Channel. This channel is all about world news and Bible prophecy, pointing to the soon return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I am asking that if you can, to please help to financially support this ministry. If you feel led to pledge any amount of money, it would be extremely helpful and greatly appreciated. There is a PayPal link in the description box and in my pinned comment below. You can also donate using Cash App. My cash tag is dollar sign watchman 1963 thank you all so much for your prayers and support god bless former president donald trump maintains a sizable lead heading into the iowa caucuses next week but a video touted by trump has rubbed some evangelicals in iowa in the wrong way we will pray to god for our strength and for our liberty we will pray for god and we will pray with god more than 50 percent of iowa evangelicals support donald trump at almost double the next closest candidate, the group is seen as the foundation for what some believe will be an easy win come caucus time. Other candidates might be saying at this point, don't believe the polls in Iowa. But the packed parking lots at his rallies and Trump supporters say otherwise. Speaking on statistics, everybody loves him. You believe the polling? I believe the people I talk to. I mean, I can't hardly find anybody that doesn't like him. The people that don't like him either aren't active or... They weren't going to change their minds anyway. Donald Trump is my guy. He has world support. He has uh, a mission that needs to be completed. He has faith in what he's doing. Trump boasts a number of pastor endorsements across the state. Hates of hell will not prevail against him. Including pastor and Iowa state legislator Brad Sherman, who prayed over the candidate at a December rally. You know, I run into Christians all the time say, how can you support President Trump? He's an immoral man, you know, et cetera, et cetera. I always want to ask, oh, yeah, yeah, who is that one candidate that's perfect? I forgot. What's his name? Oh, yeah, there isn't one. I just hear these people that have this idea about the perfect candidate and they don't cut anybody any slack. Trump's rivals are now attacking his record on pro-life issues. You think Donald Trump is not pro-life? Of course not. I mean, when, when you're saying that pro-life protections are a terrible thing, by definition, you are not pro-life. God looked down on his planned paradise and said, I need a caretaker. So God gave us Trump. A video shared on social media and played at some of his Iowa rallies titled God Made Trump has been rejected by some in the Iowa evangelical community. And on June 14, 1946, God looked down on his planned paradise and said, I need a caretaker, so God gave us Trump. God said, I need somebody willing to get up before dawn, fix this country, work all day, fight the Marxists, eat supper, then go to the Oval Office and stay past midnight at a meeting of the heads of state. So God made Trump. I need somebody with arms, strong enough to rustle the deep state, and yet gentle enough to deliver his own grandchild. Somebody to ruffle the feathers, tame cantankerous World Economic Forum, come home hungry, have to wait until the First Lady is done with lunch with friends, then tell the ladies to be sure and come back real soon and mean it. So God gave us Trump. I need somebody who can shape an ax but wield a sword, who had the courage to step foot in North Korea, who can make money from the tar of the sand, turn liquid to gold, who understands the difference between tariffs and inflation, will finish his 40-hour week by Tuesday noon, but then put in another 72 hours. So God made Trump. God had to have somebody willing to go into the den of vipers, call out the fake news for their tongues as sharp as a serpent's. The poison of vipers is on their lips, and yet stop. So God made Trump. God said, I need somebody who will be strong and courageous, who will not be afraid or terrified of the wolves when they attack, a man who cares for the flock, a shepherd to mankind who won't ever leave nor forsake them. I need the most diligent worker to follow the path and remain strong in faith and know the belief of God and country. Somebody who's willing to drill, bring back manufacturing and American jobs, farm the lands, secure our borders, build our military, fight the system all day, and finish a hard week's work by attending church on Sunday. And then his oldest son turns and says, Dad, let's make America great again. Dad, let's build back a country to be the envy of the world again. 
so God made Trump. A man who cares for the flock, a shepherd to mankind who won't ever leave nor forsake them. Christians are not called to create a kingdom here on earth. Philippians 3.20 For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Donald Trump is not the shepherd to mankind. Jesus is. John 10, 11 through 15. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. But a hireling, he who is not the shepherd, one who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf catches the sheep and scatters them. The hireling flees because he is a hireling and does not care about the sheep. I am the good shepherd, and I know my sheep, and am known by my own. As the Father knows me, even so I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. Jesus is the only one who will never leave us or forsake us. Hebrews 13, 5 and 6 Let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? He is definitely not the Messiah of, uh, of people for Iowa. While Fort Des Moines Church of Christ pastor Mike Damastis calls Trump the most pro-life president in America's history, he adds the video is disturbing to him and other evangelicals. It's got this messianic own to it, and that's that's not how we view Trump. Uh, and I have every bit of respect for our former president. I do. I genuinely do. But when you're when you're positing yourself in a messianic way, that's maybe a little bit more humility, please. Do enough voters share the same concerns to make a difference? That should be decided during the caucus vote on Monday. Evangelicals are struggling to understand the words and actions of President Trump. Christians believe and profess that the only true king of Israel is God, as clearly stated in Isaiah 44, 6. Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts. I am the first, and I am the last. Besides me, there is no God. Messianic claims are dangerous, because God does not share his glory with anyone. Another historic leader, Herod Agrippa, the King of Judea, after Jesus' death, once found himself in a similar situation. In the New Testament, chapter of Acts 12, Herod was called God. Herod's response? He took credit. The Lord's response? He sent an angel to kill Herod, as we read in Acts 12, 21-23. So on a set day, Herod, arrayed in royal apparel, sat on his throne and gave an oration to them. And the people kept shouting, The voice of a God, and not of a man. Then immediately an angel of the Lord struck him, because he did not give glory to God, and he was eaten by worms and died. In Herod's case, the Bible doesn't say he repeated the title, only that he allowed it to be spoken. Perhaps, President Trump can learn from Herod's mistake. Jesus said, as a sign of his coming and the end of the age, there would be an increase in deception, false Christ who will deceive many, wars and rumors of wars, nation against nation and kingdom against kingdom, famines, pestilences, earthquakes, Christian persecution, apostasy, false prophets, and lawlessness causing the love of many to grow cold. Jesus said all of these signs would come like birth pains. Jesus was likening last day's events to a woman in labor. As the labor progresses, the pains increase in both frequency and intensity until the baby finally comes. As we get closer to Jesus' return, all the signs he gave us as a sign of his coming and the end of the age will become more frequent and more intense. All of these signs are manifesting around the world in our time. We've got more on that military bombardment of terrorist targets in Yemen from U.S. and British fighter jets, ships and a submarine. We are just learning new details as President Biden today issued a fresh warning to the Houthi militia that the U.S. will fight back if the rebels retaliate. The president tonight clearly trying to contain what is now an escalating regional conflict. It is exactly what many had feared as the worst outcome as we are now nearly 100 days since 
since Hamas attacked Israel. Repeated ultimatums gave way to military action overnight as F-18 fighter jets and support aircraft led the way in a bombing campaign against Iranian-backed Houthi militants, including the use of U.S. warships and a submarine. British typhoon fighters took off from bases in Cyprus, covering a distance so long they needed refueling aircraft. Cockpit footage is said to show airstrikes aimed at degrading Houthi capabilities and weapons stocks. U.S. military officials say more than 150 precision-guided munitions struck over 60 targets at nearly 30 locations, including command centers, missile and drone launch sites, and air defense systems. And the U.S. government has confirmed that Iranian forces themselves seized an oil tanker off the coast of Oman, carrying U.S.-sanctioned crude oil, raising tensions even further between American forces and adversaries in the region setting the stage for more confrontations to come. Chanting death to America, death to Israel, hundreds of thousands of protesters gathered in Sana to denounce airstrikes carried out by Washington and London on Houthi military targets. Bombings denounced by the group's spokesperson. As part of its support for continued Israeli crimes in Gaza, the U.S.-British enemy launched a brutal aggression against the Republic of Yemen with 73 raids. This attack will not go unpunished. For the first time since the start of the war in Gaza, U.S. and British forces struck Houthi arsenals and military sites in Yemen, including the capital, Sana'a. The U.S. president said these actions send a strong message, a view echoed by the British prime minister. We need to send a strong signal that this breach of international law is wrong. Uh, people can't act like this with impunity, and that's why, together with allies, we've decided to take this action. Meanwhile, Iran, the sponsor of the Houthis, denounced the arbitrary action and blatant violation of the sovereignty of Yemen. China has called for restraint, while Russia has accused the U.S. of endangering regional stability. We strongly condemn these irresponsible actions of the U.S. and its allies. A large-scale military escalation in the Red Sea region could destabilize the entire Middle East. The U.S. military launched another airstrike in Yemen on a Houthi-controlled site believed to be used by the rebel group to attack commercial ships in the Red Sea. The Houthis have been targeting international shipping routes to show their support for Hamas in their fight against Israel. The Houthis are vowing retaliation for these strikes, prompting the U.S. Navy to warn American ships to stay out of the Red Sea in the Gulf of Aden for the next 72 hours. From the start of this conflict in October, U.S. officials and the international community have feared it's spreading into a larger regional war. And we've already seen an increase in cross-border conflict between Israel and Hezbollah in Lebanon. Now Yemeni Houthis, who are backed by Iran, are vowing to retaliate, making the Red Sea a potential third hotspot. In Yemen's capital Friday, action sparked a reaction. Large protests following the U.S. and U.K.-led strikes on more than 30 Houthi rebel targets. Retaliation for the Iranian-backed group's targeting of shipping vessels in the Red Sea and Gulf of Aden. We put together a group of nations that are going to say that if they continue to act and behave as they do, we'll respond. Standing in front of a fire truck in Allentown, Pennsylvania, President Biden said he's worried continued attacks on shipping routes could drive up the price of oil. I'm very concerned. That's why we got to stop it. According to the Pentagon, more than 150 precision-guided munitions struck at least 60 targets, including command centers, missile and drone launch sites, and air defense systems. I think it's important to remember how we got here. 27 attacks against international commercial shipping and Mariner since November 19th, multiple warnings to stop, and we said very loud and clear there would be consequences, and last night there were. The Houthis, a minority Shia Muslim group, are backed by Iran and have been battling for control of Yemen since 2014. The bloody civil war has displaced about 4.5 million people, and more than two-thirds of Yemen's population is in dire need of humanitarian assistance, according to the UN. We are just extremely worried about the risks uh, and the, the, the greater risks of escalation. Yesterday, President Biden dismissed the idea that targeting Houthi groups could antagonize Iran. Iran does not want to war with us. The strikes received bipartisan, though not universal, support. So I think it was an appropriate action. 
with some progressive Democrats saying Congress should have to pre-approve any such actions. It's time to put together an international coalition. There should have been time to come to us and ask for permission. And some Republicans saying it didn't go far enough. That won't change the equation. The Iranians could care less how many Houthis die, how many people from Hamas die. You'll never get Iran through their proxies to back off until you hit Iran. As a sign of his coming and the end of the age, Jesus declares, and you will hear of wars and rumors of wars, see that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. The prophets of the Old Testament prophesied of these future military conflicts in Isaiah 17.1, in which Damascus, Syria will be destroyed in a single night. Jeremiah 49, the prophecy of Alam, which could infer an Israeli attack upon Iran's nuclear program. Psalm 83, in which the Muslim nations that border Israel will mount an attack on Israel in order to cut them off from being a nation. Ezekiel 38 and 39, known as the War of Gog and Magog. In this prophecy, a coalition of nations led by Russia, Iran, and Turkey will attack Israel in the last days in order to take Israel's wealth. And in the latest that's coming in from the ongoing war between Russia and Ukraine, former Russian President Dmitry Medvedev has warned of a potential nuclear attack on Ukraine. And in a stern warning, he issued that any Ukrainian attacks on missile on sites within Russia using weapons supplied by the United States can provoke such an attack. Medvedev is currently serving as the deputy chairman of Russia's Security Council and he has raised serious concerns about some Ukrainian military commanders contemplating these strikes on Russian sites. Now, however, that he refrained from naming the commanders or providing any extra details about the alleged plan. The former Russian president also highlighted pointers from Russia's state policy specifying the conditions under which a Russian president might consider employing nuclear weapons. Despite the gravity of this warning, there has been no immediate reaction from Ukraine. However, it is important to note that the risk of nuclear escalation has loomed over the ongoing war. Critics, however, have viewed this statement as an attempt to dissuade the West from providing further support to Ukraine. This is because the United States and its allies have pledged nearly $250 billion in military and other assistance to Kyiv. And the global implications are also quite significant, considering that Russia and the United States possess the largest nuclear arsenals in the world. According to the Federation of American Scientists, President Vladimir Putin controls almost 6,000 nuclear warheads. While the U.S., on the other hand, commands about around 5,200 nuclear warheads. Taiwan's presidential election has been described as a choice between war and peace. With growing concerns, China could invade the self-governing island, which it considers its own territory. That looming threat both the biggest source of tension between the U.S. and China and the key issue at the center of this vote. The election here has become a very tight race and the outcome will reach far beyond Taiwan. William Lai with the ruling Democratic People's Party says he's ready to defy China. We have to win because we have to protect democracy. China sees Lai as favoring independence. Chinese military officials vowing today to smash any attempt at that. Polls show Lai neck and neck with Ho Yui of the Kuomintang Party, which is open to dialogue with the mainland. We can never ignore their existence, Ho says of China. Misunderstandings will lead to conflict. China makes no secret of its intentions when it comes to Taiwan. Xi Jinping in a New Year's speech saying reunification is inevitable. For years, China has increased surveillance, fighter jets, even missiles around the island. It's also ramping up disinformation, including messaging to sow doubt about U.S. health. Uh, the message is that there will be no knight in shiny armor to save you when things really go down. The third candidate, Ko Wenzhu, wants stronger ties to China and the U.S. Finding a balance between the two, he says, this is the toughest job for the Taiwanese president. A crucial vote for Taiwan, with the U.S. and China looming over it. A bomb cyclone detonating across the country. With another round of twisters and hail hammering the south and blizzards slamming the Midwest with blinding snow and whipping winds causing whiteout conditions, snarling roads and blanketing neighborhoods. We're mainly dealing with accidents. 
temperatures plunging well below zero, setting the stage for possibly the coldest Iowa caucus in history Monday, with wind chills expected to feel like 30 below. And more avalanches in the west. Near Stevens Peak in Idaho, authorities say two people were rescued. One is still missing. And a second avalanche in Lake Tahoe after one Wednesday killed one person and buried three others, including Jason Parker. You said you couldn't move. No, you, you can't move at all. It's, it's a scary feeling. Rescuers seen here digging for Parker, who was trapped under close to four feet of snow. They found him after eight minutes. I started yelling, help, help, as, as much as I could. My adrenaline's rushing. My, I just, uh, it was, it was so, it was surreal. In the Northeast, another round of torrential rain is set to worsen ongoing flooding. Rivers in New Jersey still rising from the last round of severe weather earlier this week. Hard hit communities nationwide preparing for more blows as Mother Nature shows no sign of letting up. The final climate report card is in for 2023, and as a planet, we are getting a failing grade. The European Union's climate monitor says that last year was, no surprise, the hottest in recorded history, and that is by a large margin. The planet's rising temperatures have also led to more billion dollar disasters here in the U.S. than we have ever seen. We just got some new data from the NOAA. That's stands for National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. What have we learned from it? What, what should we know? Yeah, as you mentioned, more major disasters, 28 last year. That shatters the previous record of 22 from 2020. Also found out that December was the hottest December we've ever had. So the U.S. is a whole a little bit cooler, but the big takeaway here is what's happening to the planet. So when you look at some of these graphs, uh, the thing to pay attention to is not just that last year was the hottest year. It's also the margin, that top line, that dark orange line, shows 2023. So not just setting records, setting records by records. Uh, you know, the scientists say this is clear. This is being driven by burning fossil fuels, oil, coal, That's and gas. That's fascinating. Um, so what are the experts saying? Is the heating of the planet reversible, I think, is what everybody is wondering. Yeah, there, I mean, there is good news. We have to do two things at once. We have to, yes, bring down emissions of fossil fuels, coal, oil, and gas. We've got to zero that out. At the same time, we have to help our communities adapt because there are places all across America, all around the world, which are dealing with sea level rise, these extreme rainfall and flooding events, uh, extreme heat headed into the summer. And actually, that's one last thing to mention here is that because we're in the second year of an El Nino, a lot of climate scientists are saying, yeah, last year was hot. We set a record. 2024, they're thinking, is going to be even hotter, including here in the U.S., very likely the hottest summer we will have ever felt. The world is baffled at the events taking place in the weather. And yet, it was foretold 2,000 years ago in Bible prophecy that this would happen. Satan, the great deceiver, often tries to front-run God by giving people wrong ideas ahead of time about what is prophesied to happen. Satan has tricked mankind into believing that climate change is real and in turn has blinded many people to the gospel of Jesus Christ, as we read in 2 Corinthians 4, 3, and 4. But even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age is blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. Jesus said a sign of his return would be more frequent and more intense weather, as we read in Matthew 24, 7 and 8. And there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of birth pains. Pestilence is the Greek word loimus, which means a plague. Definition of a plague is any large-scale calamity, especially when thought to be sent by God. God has used plagues in the form of extreme weather in the past and will again in the future. The seventh plague on Egypt was hail. Don't forget about the famine in Joseph's time. One of the biggest is the flood in the book of Genesis. In the future, during the seven-year tribulation, God will once again use extreme weather in the form of pestilence as judgment. In Revelation 16:21, God uses hailstones weighing 100 pounds each, and great hail from heaven fell upon men, each hailstone about the weight of a talent. Men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, since that plague was exceedingly great. In Revelation 16:8 and 9, God uses scorching heat. Then the fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, and power was given to him to scorch men with fire, and men were scorched with great heat, and they blasphemed the name of God who has power over these plagues, and they did not repent and give him glory. Climate change is simply Satan's counter to Jesus' signs of his return and the end of the age. So when Jesus Christ warns us that just before his second coming, there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places, you had better believe that these occurrences are a sign from God and that he is about to intervene. Don't let Satan blind you to the gospel of Jesus Christ. The extreme weather the world has been witnessing is not climate change. 
is God letting us know our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, is returning. Back here at home, new reports show persistently higher prices on goods and services across the country. A sign the Federal Reserve's drive to slow down inflation to its 2% target will likely remain a bumpy one. The new report from the Labor Department shows overall prices rose 3.4% from a year ago. More than half the increase in prices from November to December reflect higher housing costs, energy costs, along with the price of food, which also contributed to inflation. A survey shows Americans of different racial backgrounds basically agree the government should prioritize economy and foreign policy issues this election year. For Megan Cherry in Temple Terrace, Florida, feeding a family of six means cutting what makes it into the grocery cart. So things that aren't necessary for meals are kind of getting cut out. Polls show many Americans are dissatisfied with the economy. That disconnect is a likely issue in the 2024 elections. About 7 in 10 U.S. adults name economic issues as a top five topic they'd like the government to prioritize in 2024. Experts say much of the public remains frustrated by higher prices. Prices are still 17 percent higher than they were before the inflation surge began and are still rising. According to an Axios.com vibe check, if you're a Republican, rural, renting, a woman, or living single, you disproportionately feel anxious and funky about your finances. At Covenant Baptist Church's Food Pantry in Southwest D.C., co-coordinator Craig Johnson has seen so much more demand, families are now allowed to come once a week instead of once a month. One economy expert says the Federal Reserve overpromised what they could deliver, leaving people pessimistic about their pocketbooks. This inflation is is permanently high. Prices are never going to come down. The rising inflation in Argentina is taking a toll on asado, the traditional Argentinian barbecue, as people cut down on their spending to survive rising prices. Now, meat shops like the ones you are seeing on your screen were once bustling with customers. But now, customer footfall is falling as inflation nears 200%. Not just meat, vegetable and fruit prices too have hit the roof in Argentina and this has forced people like Susana Barrio to no longer invite her friends over for the traditional barbecue, a key part of social life in the South American farming nation. The joy it gave me to invite my friends for a barbecue, which is typical here in Argentina, now that's impossible. Between the meat and the vegetables, we were at least four or six people. You cannot do that today. We have had to eliminate things that made life a little brighter, you know. I'm an older woman. I won't get to see my country the way I'd like to see it. I really won't. The Bible warns us of a time where there will be super inflation, as we read in Revelation 6, 5 and 6. When he opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come and see. So I looked, and behold, a black horse. And he who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for a denarius, and three quarts of barley for a denarius, and do not harm the oil and the wine. In this prophecy, it will cost a day's wages just for a loaf of bread. We are not in the tribulation period yet, but we are getting extremely close. Tonight, raging riots in Papua New Guinea, triggering a 14-day state of emergency. Angry protesters spilling into the streets of the nation's capital, Port Mosby, looting buildings and laying waste to businesses. Over a dozen stores have been set on fire. Prime Minister James Marape swiftly addressing the disorder, bringing in armed forces to contain the masses. The spark for these riots igniting after an unexpected pay cut for public servants, including police and defense officers. But the government says this all boils down to a simple computer glitch, which they have promised to fix. The chaos first started as peaceful demonstrations led by the affected public servants, but has evolved into protests over wider issues facing the most populous nation in the Southwest Pacific. Where nearly 40% of citizens live below the poverty line and the cost of living is rapidly increasing. 
Despite its economic turmoil, Papua New Guinea is a strategic partner for the United States. Secretary of State Antony Blinken visiting the island nation last spring to sign a defense deal as the U.S. and its allies look to limit China's influence in the region. But for the nation's 10 million people, the turmoil playing out in front of them right now poses a much more urgent threat. In 48 years of independence, I can't recall in my lifetime seeing this level of devastation in, in a single day event. It's just sent with frustration reaching a boiling point. The U.S. Embassy in Papua New Guinea says demonstrations have ended for now, but discontent still roots itself deep in a country plagued with economic woes. Luke 2125, and there will be signs in the sun, in the moon, and in the stars, and on the earth distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring. One of the many signs we are living in the last days right before the return of Jesus Christ is nations will be in a state of perplexity or uncertainty over what to do in a difficult situation. This is exactly what is happening in our world today. Tonight, Ecuador presses on a war against criminal gangs now designated by the government as terrorists. Soldiers patrolling the streets in Guayaquil, the country's largest city and epicenter of the violence. On Tuesday, a horrific 30-minute attack on a television station broadcasted live and seen by the world forcing the country's president, Daniel Novoa, to double down at a state of emergency. No vamos a dejar que un grupo de terroristas detenga el país. Guayaquil still crippled with fear, as 90% of stores in the downtown area remain closed. For now, even some U.S. airlines have decided to temporarily halt flights to Guayaquil, with experts asking Americans to reconsider travel. Don't go unless you have to. If these gang members are doing this you know, outside the sort of the, the prison system or, or outside of fighting each other, there's an increased risk of civilians being sort of caught in the crossfire. In an effort to restore peace, the police publicly displaying alleged gang members they have arrested. The tensions also spreading beyond Guayaquil. Authorities reporting arson at a nightclub in the Amazon city of Coca killing two people. A bomb scare causing a mass response in Ecuador's capital, Quito, and nearly 160 prison guards still being held hostage by inmates at at least seven prisons, according to the nation's prison agency. This woman, who was scared to show her face for security reasons, says she's the wife of one of the abducted guards and has had no information about her husband's whereabouts for five days. <laughs> President Novoa sitting down with Telemundo's anchor Julio Vaqueiro today for an exclusive interview. Ecuador was one of the safest countries in the region. And today, it's one of the most violent places in the world. What happened? The lack of security is based on what has happened politically in the previous years. We have let these international organizations and these terrorists uh, gain ground and insert themselves in various institutions. You've said that Ecuador is at war. How will you win this war? And we have received full support also of the people, not only on the of the political class. And together, with uh, working you know, hand in hand, we will succeed and we will have a victory. Is global chaos the new normal? As anyone can plainly see, the world is in a state of decay, moral, economic, political, every way possible. People are saying the world is out of control and looking for someone anyone to rescue the planet. Soon, very soon, a leader will appear on the horizon that appears to have all the answers, to calm the oceans, to bring peace to all the nations. His title will be the Antichrist, and he will be welcomed by millions of those on earth not taken with the rapture. Unfortunately, his true identity will be known soon to those left behind that his true intentions are death, destruction, and control. So yes, global chaos is the new normal until the Lord Jesus Christ comes at the end of the Antichrist's seven-year reign of terror and establishes true peace on earth. It seems like a good time for Satan to present the lawless one to the world. 2 Thessalonians 2, 7-12 For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth, 
and destroy with the brightness of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan, with all power, signs, and lying wonders, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this reason, God will send them strong delusion, that they should believe the lie, that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. The signs of Jesus' soon return are so strong now, and the evidence is so clear that any person willing to accept the truth can see that the end of the world as we know it is near. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But God demonstrates his own love toward us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. These are the ABCs of salvation. A. Admit that you're a sinner. B. Believe in your heart that Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried, and God raised him from the dead. C. Call upon the name of the Lord, and you will be saved. Jesus paid the price for mankind's sin. He has provided a way to spend eternity with him and the Father. All you have to do is believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved. God has already done all the work. All you must do is receive, in faith, the salvation God offers. Fully trust in Jesus alone as the payment for your sins. Believe in him, and you will not perish. God is offering you salvation as a gift. All you have to do is accept it. Jesus is the only way of salvation. That being said, we must repent of our sins. While repentance is not a work that earns salvation, repentance unto salvation does result in works. It is impossible to truly and fully change your mind without that causing a change in action. In the Bible, repentance results in a change in behavior. Repentance, properly defined, is necessary for salvation. One day, Jesus is coming. You may be at church. You may be at work. You may be asleep. God grant that you will be ready when he makes his personal appearance. My God, what if his appearance occurs on a Sunday morning. My prophetic word to you this morning is get ready, get ready! Time is short. Call upon the name of Jesus today.